Thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Good. Thank you for coming this morning, uh, nice and early. I uh, hope you've had your breakfast and, uh, or tea or coffee, whatever it is you need to have to get you going this morning. So for the next one hour, we want to look at a critical subject, which is also an emotional one, and one that often a lot of people find very controversial. But I think what I want to do this morning is just to help us to reflect on this subject, uh, looking at it from a perspective of theology, history, anthropology, and sociology. And the reason why I want to do that is just to ground some thinking in sort of how we engage this conversation so that we can move forward. Now, when it comes to the issue of race, evangelicals are very slow to that conversation. That is the starting point. I just need to say that out and loud. When it comes to the issue of race, evangelicals are very slow and reluctant sometimes to that conversation uh, for various reasons. So it's not one of our strong points, let's just say. But why is that? Uh, why is it that we, we struggle to talk about issues of race? And I think sometimes when we look at it from an American perspective, th there is a way we can say, well, Americans have lots of problems. They have lots of issues. Of course they do. Uh, anyone who is familiar with the history of the country will realize why Americans have a lot of history and why there's a problem around that. But for us in the British context, I think there is a way we can look at America and look at it with all its flaws and all its problems. Whereas actually on this other side of the pond, we have lots of issues as well. And I think there is something about being British that doesn't like to rock the boat, isn't it? We, 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 you know, we're very polite. And so we don't, issues around, there are some topics that it's just like a taboo. One is finances. Oh, we just don't talk about money. That's one. Another is race. Oh, no, no. Uh, that's just too complicated. So let's avoid it altogether. But where UK is at the moment, and when the church in the UK is, it's a conversation we can no longer avoid. Even if you want to avoid it, it will come back one way or the other. And the reason why I said that is this. Uh, let's just start with the census. Uh, the, uh, the census in 2011. Uh, the ethnicity in terms of England and Wales was around 14%. This last census is increased to 183 in England and Wales. But actually, I think that's an estimated number because I'm very much convinced that not every person of color put down their details in the census. If everyone does that, I think the numbers will probably shoot up to around 25%. So, issues around ethnicity is growing in the UK. And oftentimes when we talk about this conversation, people say, oh yeah, but that's only in London or Birmingham or Liverpool or the major cities in the UK. Yes, that's true, but people are moving out because London is expensive. Uh, many of the major cities are expensive. So people are moving out to rural areas, to countryside, to different places. So, and at the moment, I'm having, I work for the Evangelical Alliance. I lead a network called One People Commission, which basically brings together different church leaders, African Caribbean church leaders, African church leaders, South Korean church leaders, Chinese church leaders and Latin American church leaders and white British church leaders. So it's, it's quite an exciting initiative that I lead, traveling around the country, meeting different leaders. About two weeks ago, I was in Milton Keynes speaking to about 100 Chinese pastors who have been in this country for a while and the new ones who have arrived from Hong Kong, the Hong Kong migration in that sense. So 
One of the conversations I'm having at the moment is a lot of pastors are calling, not from the major cities, from rural areas. And what they're saying is this, <clears throat> Israel, can you help us? We've just got a black family that's just moved to the area and they started coming to the church. We don't know what to do. <laughs> so that is happening. Or we just have an Asian family or we just have Hong Kong migrants started attending our church. How should we respond? So migration is bringing people in. And that, of course, UK migration laws is changing, particularly around refugees and stuff. So numbers are going to be curbed. But nevertheless, those who have come in already, they are moving. People on the move, they are moving around. And as they're moving around, life happens. So it's not impossible that your grandchildren might get married to someone who is Asian or African or Caribbean. So you might see it as a distant subject, but actually it could become very personal quite quickly. You never know. So what I'm simply saying is that the dynamics of this conversation are changing quite fast. And I think since the death of George Floyd, that has opened up a wound that was never really healed. You might be thinking, was there a wound? What was he talking about? Let's look at something and get into the heart of this conversation. Uh, but also before I continue, because this conversation is uh, it, it's a tricky one, and what I want to try and do this morning is just to help you to open up a little bit and just help us to go on the journey. So it's not impossible that after this talk, some of you might feel angry. It's not impossible that some might feel shame, some might feel uh, guilt. That, that is not my intention. My intention is how we can have this conversation and move it forward. But nevertheless, I, I have to mention some things. I have to go through some things just to help us appreciate this. So the topic I was given was humanity and ethnicity ethnicities. The word race was not used in the topic I was given. And the simple fact is, you won't find the word race in the Bible. The word race was never used in the Bible. And there's a reason for that. The Bible uses the word, or the word ethnos or ethne, which means, which is where we get our word ethnicity from. The other thing that the Bible uses is laos, which means people. So when the Bible talks about people of God, Laos. So those are the kind of words that the Bible uses. So hence, we're talking about uh, humanity and ethnicity. But I want to look at that through sort of, because we're talking about being human. I want to look at it through four images. One is the image of God. And then the second one is European image. <clears throat> and then the third one is I'm using the continent of Africa as an example. Uh, I can use Latin American as an uh, example. I can use Asian as an example. But I'm using African as an example in this case. So forgive me if most of my references is looking at the continent in some ways and the impact in the British context. So the third is African image. And the fourth one is what I'm calling intercultural image. So we're going to look at it through these four images in that sense. So as I said earlier, the word race is not found in the Bible uh, because it's not sort of an issue uh, in that sense. God created one human race, one humanity. That is the starting point of any conversation. So the doctrine of creation opens us up to this idea of one humanity. God didn't create races or racism. That wasn't God. God created one human race. And I think that idea, that imago dei, that doctrine of creation, that God created male and female in his image, few things that we can derive from that understanding is equality of all, irrespective uh, of who we are. God, because God created us one humanity, there is that equality of all. We all share in the image of God. There is also dignity uh, in that sense. Every human being deserves 
dignity, and also respect. Now, these are ideas that, of course, UN has nicked from the church. Uh, so, but that's not the subject of today uh, in that sense. But this doctrine gives us this understanding and this holistic idea of humanity. One human race. There is an African philosophy that brings this doctrine out in a very powerful way. It's called Ubuntu. And Ubuntu simply says, I am because you are. So it's simply saying that we do not exist in isolation. We exist in a community. It's not like the French philosopher that says, I think, therefore, I am. And so that Ubuntu gives us an understanding of our interdependence, not our independence uh, in that sense. And I suppose one of the struggles in the Western world is that we are very independent uh, because life and our worldview is premised on individuality, individualism in that sense. But God created us to be relational. God created us to be equal, to relate to each other very well. So that is the starting point uh, in that sense, in terms of conversations around the image of God. And so the image of God, or the doctrine of creation, is where we can ground our understanding of unity. Because God created one human race. We are united because of that. And there is a very powerful scripture that I want to read, which brings this out. This was Paul. Uh, you guys are Bible scholars. Paul in Acts chapter 17, uh, verse 26, was wrestling with these ideas among Greek philosophers. And it says, from one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. Paul says that from one man, God made every nation. But actually, when you look at the Greek translation, there are some Greek manuscripts that actually didn't have uh, the word anthropos, which is the word humanity or man in there. It's got a different word. It's called hamatia, which is the word for blood. So another way you can render this text is actually from one blood, God made nations of men. From one blood. Now, anyone who's familiar with the Old Testament will realize that actually the Old Testament has a lot of symbolisms around blood because of sacrifices, because of offerings, because of covenants, the idea of covenant, the, the idea around a bond. So perhaps this text, maybe there is something that is saying around from one blood that again, reminding us of something that we share together. Because our blood looks the same. Our blood looks the same. And there is something powerful about that. That God created us to be one. But not uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. Despite the fact that God created one human race, that humanity is expressed with different physical features different skin pigmentation. My wife is white British, and one of the things we joke about is the shape of our nose. I've got an African nose, a West African nose. It's flat. My wife's nose is very English. It's very pointy. It's very different. Why would God do that? There's a reason. Despite the fact that God created one humanity, that humanity is expressed in different ways. That is the beauty of creation. The beauty of God's world. The beauty of the humanity that God created. And so that humanity is expressed in different ways. But one of the doctrines that I think actually brings that ethnic difference out very powerfully is the doctrine of the incarnation. We will talk more about this towards the end. The incarnation of Jesus brings out that ethnic difference. Why? Because Jesus was born in a particular culture, in a particular time, in a particular region, speaking a specific language. 
And so the doctrine of incarnation gives us the bridge into understanding ethnic difference. So we must look it together, the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of incarnation. Doctrine of creation gives us that idea of one humanity, one human race. But incarnation helps us to understand the specificity of each person. And that is very crucial in this conversation. But as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this uh, as we continue towards the end. But then we must ask the question, how did we go from humanity being created in God's image to humanity being reshaped in the European image? That is an important question that is being asked today by different aspects of our society, by different people, by a lot of young people. And so there is the need for us to revisit history, to understand certain pains and trauma that is happening in today's world. And as I said, the death of George Floyd opened up questions around this for a lot of people. I remember when the death of George Floyd happened. Even though it happened in America, it didn't happen in the UK, it didn't happen in any European city, but what that did was for a lot of people of color, some of the deep-seated issues that they've been wrestling with came up because there was an identification with something here. There was an identification with pain, with trauma. And so that came up. And so a lot of people are revisiting this question in different ways. And so questions around black lives matter is one example. And I know it's very controversial, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. But that's one way that question is being expressed. And I think as a church, if we dismiss this question, what we will be doing is we will not be able to go on a journey to build God's intercultural kingdom in Britain. And so even if we don't agree with everything, there is the need to listen and to understand a bit of that. So how did we go from that image of God to a European image? And I think this is where it's important to look a bit of mission history. Modern mission history started around towards the end of the 17th century. There was, do you know there was a time in Europe where people were not evangelizing? Because of extreme form of Calvinism. Uh, because of this idea that if God knows those who are elect, if God knows those who have been saved, then there's no need to preach the gospel until someone called William Carey, who founded Baptist Missionary Society. Any faithful Baptist in the house? Yeah, it's always good. I'm a Baptist minister. It's good. It's good to just, just do that. And uh, so William Carey founded Baptist Missionary Society, went to India, uh, founded it later, went to India. But one of the things he wrote about was challenging that extreme form of Calvinism that we still need means to preach the gospel. We still need to engage in overseas mission. We still need to engage, to go, to have strategies, to, to engage. Uh, let's not just depend on this theology that says God knows those who will be saved and that's it. So that changed a lot of things in Europe. Mission societies started coming up, started emerging. But this was also happening around the time that slavery was coming to an end, especially in the case of Africa. Uh, slavery was coming towards an end. And European uh, powers were thinking, okay, we have dealt with Africans through illegitimate trade, that is, slavery. Let's deal with Africans through legitimate trade. Colonization was introduced into Africa around the same period. So as missionaries were going to Africa, colonial authorities and clerks were going around the same time. And so hence, sometimes it's difficult to separate who is who and how, who's working for who. And so sometimes, in some cases, there was a conflation of authorities, a conflation of personalities, a conflation of personnel in that sense. 
and the result of that, but also because we're just coming out of slavery and entering into colonization, some of the ideas that were circulating around those days, which were very dangerous, which today we will call it pseudoscience. There was an anthropology that says, if you are Caucasian, you are at the height of human intelligence. If you are black, Jews, or Arab, you are at the bottom of human intelligence. There were European anthropologists who created such tables, which is why slavery went on for so long. But that also continued to a lot of effect during colonization and the mission period. And so the way mission was done, in 1910, there was a missionary conference in Edinburgh, a world missionary conference. It happens once in 100 years. And at this particular conference, it was said that for mission organizations going to different parts of the world, people's primal religions and culture, they cannot be seen as preparing people for the gospel. So it simply means that when you go to a place like Africa, anything African or African religion or culture must be eradicated before you plant and inseminate the gospel. And so a lot of Protestant missionaries went to Africa with that kind of ideology. What was the result? You don't just only become a Christian, you become Victorian. <laughs> if you see pictures emanating from this period, you will see a lot of Africans dressing Victorian, singing the songs from this particular period eating food from this particular period. The etiquette from this particular period. Think like us. Behave like us. Speak like us. Seven European uh, countries carved Africa. There is something called Scramble for Africa, 1884, 1885. European powers had a meeting in Berlin to carve Africa. But guess what? There was no single African leader or chief at that meeting. In fact, Africans didn't have a clue that the continent was being carved. They were not aware of it. Suddenly, land were taken. Things change for a lot in that sense. Now, at this stage, I must say something because it's very important. There are those who will look at the modern European mission movement in Africa, and we say it was all evil. That's a school of thought. There is another that we say the European mission movement in Africa was all fantastic, was all great. That's another school of thought. I subscribe to a third school of thought, which is European mission movement in Africa is a mixed package. There were some good but there were also some bad things that we need to talk about, friends. And I know some of my friends will not even agree with that because they'll be like, no, Israel, this is all bad. But when I look at it, there were some good things that were done. There were some European missionaries that went to Africa knowing that they were not going to go back home. They knew that it was the cost of discipleship. They gave it all went out there, laid all out, and died. Some died of malaria. There was a Pentecostal missionary that went to Nigeria, 1937. He died in Nigeria in 1987. And it was through the ministry of this Pentecostal missionary that I became a Christian. So you can trace some of those fruits. And some of our African brothers and sisters can do the same. That's one of the fastest growing churches in Europe today is the Redeemed Christian Church of God. That church started in Nigeria around 1952, but the founder was influenced by CMS missionaries and education. So you can trace a lot of positive stuff around that European missionary movement. But I also feel it's important that we talk about some of the things that went wrong. Why? Because the legacies of some of those things are still with us today. The impact of it People might think, what well, happened years ago? Yes, but the impact is still here today. The impact of it is still very much here today. The legacies 
of those things are still very much with us today in that sense. Do you know that growing up in Nigeria for me, I grew up in Nigeria because I'm from Nigeria, born and bred. In my primary school and secondary school, I was not encouraged to speak my language, Yoruba. Why? I was told to speak in English because we wanted to continue to be like Europeans. I've written seven books in English. Ask me to write one in Yoruba, and I won't be able to do that. I can speak the language, but I can't write in my own language properly because of the legacies of colonization. So when we're talking about these things, it's not something that happens in the past, and let's leave it there. There is a continuum, there is an impact and a legacy that continues till today. But moving on, what was the African response to that? From a secular perspective, I'm going to come to the African church response, but from a secular perspective, there was the decolonization process. And that is a word that has been thrown around today. But back then, what that simply means was that there were African leaders who felt, you know what, it is time to take our country back. It is time to take our continent back. So they started a lot of conversations, a lot of protest, uh, a lot of uh, agitation advocacy. Some were using it through the press, through the media, through writings and various things, uh, through their PhDs, some of the people that went to study abroad and so, so on. That led to African consciousness. And even when we use the word consciousness, it's interesting. Because when you say someone is conscious, it means, or when you say someone, you know, is conscious, it means you've come back from something. It means you've come back from a coma, or you've come back from the dead. So in a way, colonization and slavery killed Africans. And they had to regain their consciousness, their identity, and the sense of who they are through this process. Decolonization, consciousness, African identity. What does it mean to be African? Because if you are speaking Portuguese as an African, or you're speaking French as an African, or you're speaking Italian, the language of people that colonize you, what makes you African? People start to ask these questions, and that led to African resistance. And finally, from around 1957, Ghana became the first country to become independent of Britain. And 1960, there were several countries that became independent in that sense. But this is the secular uh, response from the church response. There was an African theologian, John Imbiti, who said, the African church doesn't have a theology because we don't know what we think about God. We've been taught how to think about God. We've been taught how to do church. And so there were African theologians who started talking and start saying there is the need for an African theology that helps us to think about God, about the Holy Spirit, about the Bible, and about the church in African concepts and ideas. And so that led to the start of African theology. From some of the church's perspective, the question was, why can't we use African drums? Why can't we wear African clothing? Those were some of the questions people were asking. Why can't we have African prophets? Those were the questions people were asking. Why can't we preach in our own language? So there was a movement of church called African indigenous churches that emerged at this particular period. Asking those questions and saying, you know what? We need African drums. We need to do things in our own language. That emerged. But in Southern Africa a different story developed. With the Dutch Reformed Church and the way South Africa was polarized along white, colored, and black. In those days, if I put a pencil in my hair, if it stays, it means I'm black because there is Afro and is able to hold the pencil. If the pencil falls, it means I'm colored because my hair is sort of mixed or Malaysian or Malay. That's how people were categorized in Southern Africa. And so you had 
Baptist ministers, Methodists, and so on, who started talking of the need of understanding the black experience in South Africa. So that led to black theology in Southern Africa and Desmond Tutu and uh, those who came later started talking about that and then post-colonial theology in that sense. So that, that is sort of the response from the church. But going back to where we started from, if God created one human race and he wants us to be united, as much as I love all those attempts, African theology and so on, which is brilliant for us to regain a sense of who we are in Christ. Something is still missing. Because God did not create us to be independent. God did not create us to be interdependent. God created us to be interdependent. And so I think there is the need for an intercultural image. And the entry into that is the incarnation that I talked about, that understanding that Jesus came and was in a particular culture. He incarnated, he became flesh, he tabernacled among us. He became a Jew, a first century Jew living in Palestine. That is incarnation of Jesus. Gives us that window into that intercultural conversation. But then the cross actually is about reconciliation, isn't it? It's about God. It's about Jesus being the bridge, reconciling us back to God, but also reconciling polarized humanity, Jews and Gentiles. And so we have a template for an intercultural image in Scripture. Paul put it beautifully in Ephesians chapter 2. He talks about the first 11 verses. He talks about God reconciling us and redeeming Gentiles from sin. But then he went on from verse 12 to talk about the need for Gentiles to be included in the family of God. So that God created one new humanity. And from there emerged a different ecclesiology, a different church, which is no surprise that on the day of Pentecost, the people that gathered on that day, they came from different parts of the world. Even though many of them were Jews, but they were Jews in the diaspora. The day of Pentecost, God birthed the church in diversity. Hence, different languages were needed to confirm that diversity. And so, the church of Jesus today must continue to reflect that diversity. How? By building inclusive intercultural churches not multicultural churches because what we have today is multicultural churches where different people congregate together but coexisting in a single congregation life is not properly shared people are together in a congregation but the leadership there's still one culture that is dominant in an intercultural church Integration is at the heart of the matter. How do we integrate together? Each person and their experience matters. And how does that shape how we do church in Christ? That is the vision we need to work towards today to address issues around racial injustice in the church. An intercultural church, not a monocultural church. So the challenge is this for us. How can we journey from a monocultural church, a single culture church, to a multicultural church, many culture church, to an intercultural church, many culture church, but not assimilating, integrating. Britain is multicultural. And so if we depend on a multicultural church, how? Are we going to be countercultural and kingdom oriented? So we have to rise above and move beyond where Britain is. Because the multicultural agenda in Britain has actually failed. But the church can be that salt and light. How we relate with each other, how we love each other, how we share life together, how we understand each other's humanity is very powerful for today's context. And we need that desperately and seriously in today's world. I'm going to leave it there so that we can ask questions. Thank you for listening.
Israel, thank you very much. Do put up a hand if you'd like to ask a question, make a response, and I'll come around with the microphone. See a lady just here. Thank you for that. Could you give us um, uh, some, some, some something for further reading, especially in the UK context, in the UK rather context. than the, the US context, of which course. is quite different? Sure. So, um, so there are different people who have written about some of this stuff. And uh, uh, there's a friend of mine called Ben Lindsay, who has written, we need to talk about race in the church. So that's one book uh, by Ben Lindsay. There's another friend called Chine McDonald. Uh, she leads Theos uh, Think Tank. She's written a very controversial book. Even the title is very controversial. God is not a white man and other revelations. <laughs> I didn't write it. She wrote it, so just to, <laughs> just to be clear. And I've written some books, which you can find in the bookshop uh, behind you, uh, African Voices, Towards an African British Theologies. And I've also written another one called Discipleship, Suffering, and Racial Justice, Mission in a Pandemic World. You can find them in the bookshop. So just a few recommendations. All British. Uh, thank you so much, Israel. Really helpful. Uh, I wonder if you could give us a few examples of where intercultural church has actually happened in the UK. Thank you. So, as I said earlier, one of the privileges I have is traveling around the UK, preaching in different churches. And I can say to you that there are many multicultural churches, but few intercultural churches. But I've managed to map some few. There is, in Wales, an intercultural church in Cardiff called City Church. It's an Elim Pentecostal church. Uh, there is Greenford Baptist Church in London. Uh, there, is, uh, in, uh, there is another one uh, called Rose Hill Full Gospel Church, led by a South Korean. This is actually an intercultural church plant, only 18 months old. Uh, so that, that's another one. It's an independent uh, church. Uh, and there is also in Birmingham, uh, there are some intercultural churches in Birmingham. Uh, again, Elim, uh, in, in that sense. And then there is in Manchester, uh, there are some intercultural churches in Manchester as well. And then in Liverpool, there is... Uh, Temple of Praise Church, led by a Nigerian. The church started in 1979. Two Nigerian couple, uh, doctors, and they did an amazing job uh, leading a church uh, you know, that brought in a lot of white working class families from the 80s, and they've managed to do that till now. Uh, and so the church is truly into cultural Temple of Praise Church in Liverpool. Uh, lovely church. So th th there are examples just to let people know that, oh, is this possible? Yes, it is. But it is hard work. It is hard work. But we um, do exist. Yes. Hi there. Yes. Hello. Hi there. Can oh, hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, it's two questions, but it's the same theme. Can you name one thing that a church can do that will propel it, will take the first steps towards an intercultural approach? And then sure. what can I do as an individual, individual. Yeah. towards an intercultural approach? Because in my logic, if I can do something, yeah. and each one of us within the church does something, yeah. just one thing, before we know it, we're on our way towards being an intercultural church. Definitely. Yeah? One thing a church can do is have it as part of your vision. And the reason why that is important is this. If you are on the leadership team, if you don't have this as a vision, it will never happen. So you need to have it as a vision. How can we become an inter how can we represent God's intercultural kingdom and have it as a vision? Then what that simply means is this. Talk about it. Do a preaching series around it. Talk about it in house groups. Give people opportunity to talk about it. Even if your church is a white majority church, you think there's no person of color here, still talk about it. 
very crucial. So that's something I think churches can do. Uh, because oftentimes we want to address this topic, but then we have our discipleship model. And then we think, oh, racial justice is over here. But how can we integrate it? The only way we do that is through our house groups, through preaching series, through engaging this in our church. So that's what churches can do. As a person, what you can do, I'm going to ask a question. Are all your friends, are they people like you? PLUs. Do you have friends who are different to you? If you do, what do you know about them? What do you really know about them? If you don't find friends who are different to you, that is a starting point. Then another thing, learn another language other than English. There is something about language and identity. I'm one of the poorer people who can only speak four languages. I've got friends who can speak five, six. There is the need to learn another language, just to understand. Because I think there are times we think, I, I'm trying to put this in a way that will be appreciated in some sense and not upset people. There is a way we equate intelligence with speaking English. And that, we need to bust that bubble. Because sometimes people say, oh, I can't hear that person, they've got an accent. Who doesn't have an accent? Even Jesus had an accent. We all have an accent. So there is the need to learn another language to help us to enter into a different worldview. Language is not just semantics and grammar. Language is a worldview. It's identity. And when we step into another person's language, there is something, it changes our thinking and our processes. Hope that's helpful. Yes? Oh, over here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to share just a little from our own family experience. Yeah. Um, so my daughter married a, a, a Londoner who's of Caribbean ethnicity, and he had always lived in London. Uh, they went to a multicultural big church in London where they were happy, um, but due to various circumstances during the pandemic, they moved up to Scotland and joined us. They went to what was a growing multicultural church in Glasgow, um, but some of the things they struggled with and some of the things that people could think about were, one, the style of worship. My son-in-law was used to playing in the band and had his own particular style, which people enjoyed, but um, they wouldn't consider other forms apart from their rigid, what they were used to. And also um, eating together, um, inviting, as you said, people of different color, different um, uh, nationality or ethnicity, however you consider them to be, to eat at your home and um, share food together. Um, also the leadership, um, including people other than white people in the leadership. They moved from that multicultural church in the city to a, more, a smaller church in a Lanarkshire town, which is actually more intercultural. And they have found real joy and happiness in that smaller church. Thank you. Thank you. That's a beautiful uh, example of how people move around and the processes. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, yes. OK. Hi. I, I just want to add uh, to the question, this, I mean, to continue the same similar question to what her sister asked her back there. Uh, what would be your advice to us as individuals, not towards, uh, you know, just uh, getting to an intercultural church or helping that in our own churches, but in society, mo I mean, how do we, as a black man, how would you say to most white people here, how can most white people here talk to a person who is not white, for example, and be comfortable to talk to or start to talk to or to ask the right questions. Most people I know and I try to talk to, encourage, people don't, don't people are scared because people are like, oh, I, can't, I don't know the language. I don't know if I can ask that. Can I say that? Or I, I'm Brazilian and uh, I ask things sometimes and people say, oh, you can say that. I, say, oh, I can. <laughs> my wife is black, my mother-in-law, my sister. It's like, you know, so I, 
I can ask that. In Brazil, we can ask that. And people are always scared of asking things. What, you know, being in Britain, in a British family, what would your advice be to people? Thank you. That's a good question. And this is one I get asked a lot. And I think, so the thing is this. If you are afraid to make mistakes, you won't have this conversation. So the first thing we have to clear in our mind is, you're going to make mistakes. Just, I make mistakes. And I can tell you some of my mistakes. So we have to be prepared that we won't get this right. So talk to people. We are human beings. Like we're staying just here in a cottage. And I remember we came on Friday unloading stuff from the car. And someone walked by and said, oh, hello. Welcome to Keswick. Fantastic. I've never met this gentleman before. But I say, hello, welcome to Keswick. Beautiful. Let's have conversations. Let's talk. People have called me names that they're not sure about. That's fine. I, I forgive people quite easily, so that's fine. Uh, you might meet other people who uh, you, I can't tell you how every person will react, uh, you know, because all black people are not the same. So <laughs> that's something we need to be aware of. So there will be different responses depending on personalities and background and history and experience. But let's not be afraid to make mistakes. Let's talk to people and ask questions. Where are you from? When people ask me where am I from, I give two answers. Originally from Nigeria, but now I live in Essex. So that's fine, uh, you know, in that sense. So, uh, you know, that just helps for people to just have a context uh, of where I am from in that sense. So I think let's not be afraid to ask questions uh, to people. And I know because of the way the conversation is, sometimes people are really afraid. And like, I just don't know what to say. Let, let's not, let that not hold us back, please. Let's not be afraid to make mistakes. As I said, I've made a lot of mistakes. And uh, let me tell you one. When I was leading a multicultural church in Woolwich in Southeast London, there was a couple in church. The wife was Brazilian. The husband was Ghanaian. And there was another uh, single parent uh, mom that started coming to church. She's from Portugal. So I just assume, well, she's from Portugal. She's from Brazil. They speak language that is common. Let me introduce them and I help the fellowship of this Portuguese lady who's just come to our church. So I spoke to the Brazilian and I said, oh, there's this Portuguese lady who's just started coming. I want to introduce her to you. And she was like, but why do you want to do that? So I was like, because I thought you speak the same language. She said, but don't you know that they are the ones that colonized us? So I was like, okay, that's interesting. And uh, I just thought, she should have moved on, but she hasn't moved on. But <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> so she was very upset with me that, why would you want to do that? So I said, I had to apologize. We make mistakes. Friends, I make a lot of mistakes on this conversation. But we must not let her hold us back. We need to talk. So please, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Let's talk. Um, what does intercultural church look like when you're divided by languages so British people aren't the only monolingual people you know I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm in a, a church and there there's a Czech church also meeting there but they don't speak much English and there's also a Romanian Roma church there likewise don't speak much English what does an intercultural church look like in that sort of circumstance Thank you. so the different multicultural churches have had the privilege of attending, there are different ways that they uh, do church. Uh, one of the best examples I've seen is Greenford Baptist Church, where there are about 45 nationalities represented there. The service is still done in English, but the worship style, sometimes they sing in Hindi, and people will sit on the floor, take off their shoes. Sometimes they will sing Yoruba praise and worship. Uh, sometimes they will sing songs from Latin America, but obviously all this will be translated into English or it will be available. Uh, and again, they do that into every aspect of the service. So while English is still the main language that is being used, there is an injection and an infusion of other languages into the streams, into what is going on uh, in that sense. 
Um, so that, that's an example of how it looks like. In other contexts, English is still the main language, but what, what is crucial is that everyone that is, there is an intercultural leadership. So the leadership definitely is very mixed uh, and reflects the church. So again, that's another paradigm that is important. And people who are leading worship or doing Sunday school, again, it's all very mixed. So basically, you look through the church, what you see in the congregation is what you see in those who lead house groups, in those who lead the whole church or the council or the trustees, it cuts right through, but still using English as a language. But there's a representation that is very strong that simply means that there's not one dominant culture in that sense. So different churches express this in different ways. Some will be very strong on the languages. Uh, others will not be, but will ensure that the representation and the equality uh, of people in the church are really affirmed in that sense. So d different models uh, and different ways of doing church. Hello, thank you. Um, I've got a question, really, and that's how do we, if we're in a majority white church that's still quite British-led, how do we avoid tokenism in doing things um, so we don't just have an African song or, you know, uh, a black leader? And how do we um, encourage people of different ethnicities into the leadership of a church that is at the very start of that journey where they may feel reticent because they don't see the leadership perhaps as a place where they feel they can be themselves. One of the important things in developing an intercultural church is visible representation from the front. There is something about seeing someone that looks like you leading from the front. And I remember this so powerfully. The first church I led in London, uh, I became the first black African minister in its 100 years history. It was 60% white, 40% African and Caribbean. And when I became the minister, something happened to those 40% people of color in that church. There was a confidence. I didn't even say anything there was a confidence that came that they wanted to lead. They wanted to you know, get more involved than ever before. And I also did alongside that uh, leadership training, encouraging different people from the church to come to the training. Uh, there were some people I encouraged specifically because I knew they, they would need that encouragement to say, actually, you got something. Can you come to this leadership training? Because I think you might have a gift of preaching. So I, I think... There is something about visible representation. So if you are starting from a monocultural church, sometimes you might not be able to avoid tokenism to some extent. Uh, of course, where possible, it's always good not to, to avoid it. Uh, but what you can do is invest in those people. Uh, encourage them to do training, uh, in-house training, or whatever style of training your church subscribe to. Encourage them to go to that uh, and then see how things happen from there. Uh, if, if there is something, something will catch on as they're doing training uh, in that sense. So I think investment is key and identification and journeying with people. Uh, and, and also, while you are in that process, because you're going from a monocultural church, invite guest speakers who are people of color. Because what I would do is, as I said, visible representation. There is something that that communicates to people I remember the second church I led, it was a white majority church, 75% white, 25% African Caribbean. And I, I led that church for about two and a half years. But I remember when I was leaving, two black ladies sat me down and said, thank you for coming to our church. You have shown us that it's possible for us to lead. And I thought, if that is all I've managed to do in two years, that's great to give confidence to two black women that they can lead, that is enough. And so there's something about, you know, if you have a guest speaker or someone, a guest worship leader to bring something different, there is something powerful about that as you go through that process to start and encourage those who are within the church to journey through that. So, so yeah, that would be helpful.
Yes. Israel, I hope you'll forgive me for asking a very leading question. Sure. Uh, are there any trainings that you can recommend uh, on this whole area of intercultural church? For those who don't know, Mark works for all nations. <laughs> Yes, uh, there, there are lots of places where you can do training. All Nations is one. Uh, so I'll give All Nations a plug. I, I'll get my fees afterwards. But anyway, we're going to cover it. Um, all Nations is good because they're doing some creative master's degree uh, around diaspora and intercultural church practice. So I will recommend that. Um, I'm also involved in an uh, initiative called Christ Theological College. It's something that myself and few friends decided to set up. Uh, we are mainly Africans and Asians, and we just felt theological education in this country that is the need to have people of color who can be a faculty, majority in that faculty, and lead. So we started something called Christ Theological College, and at the moment we're just doing certificates and about to start a diploma course. Check us out. Uh, it's something that I think it's quite exciting. For those who live in Scotland, there is uh, the center there called Edinburgh Center for the Study of World Christianity. Again, it's a good place if you're that side uh, to look that up. There are some great people doing some great stuff there. And Birmingham, uh, there's some great colleges there as well. Uh, so yeah, different places. Hi, Ezra, thanks Hi. so much. Um, we are in a majority white church, um, and yet our youth group is easily the most diverse ethnically um, group in the church, which is wonderful, and we're, we help there. Um, what that means is that we have, in particular, a number of young black men and women coming to you know, teenagers in the group, facing racism in their daily lives. And as a you know, team of leaders, none of us are of color, um, and I feel the, <laughs> I don't know, I want to help you, I want to equip you to process these experiences, but I'm just so aware of my own lack, and, and to be honest, a lack in the wider church family as well, of, and, and their parents don't come to church. So I just wondered, you know, I suppose the question is, how do majority white churches disciple young um, Christians of color um, well and kind of give them biblical framework to process the trauma that they experience that, that we don't. Yeah. Thank you. That's very important. I think this is where the training will become very important. Uh, not necessarily, you don't have to do a master's. It, it could just be a short course. Uh, so, for example, during the, when the death of George Floyd happened, one of the key questions a lot of pastors were asking is, is there a short online course that pastors can do? Because we just don't know how to talk about this stuff. And so uh, a friend called Les Isaac, who founded Street Pastors, and uh, there's an organiza mission organization called uh, Urban Expression, uh, they set up an online training course, which is just for eight weeks. It's called Black Light. Uh, black light course is eight sessions i teach on it as well and basically it takes you through cross-cultural training and stuff like that it's online it's 80 pounds uh, it's something but most of the leaders that have gone through that course black white asian others uh, they said it's been very helpful for them in understanding and processes the trauma that comes from issues around race because the thing is this i think when people of color experience racism, and it's good they're talking to you, some, pe some people will not talk about it. Some people will bury it. And actually, that affects a lot of people's mental health. There is a connection between racial injustice and mental health, which I can unpack today, but it's a big subject. So it's good that they are talking to you guys, uh, helping them to process it, because that's, that's a safe space, and that's good. So you want to keep it safe. But I will recommend doing like some of those short-term training just to help uh, to understand that better uh, in a way. Uh, and if possible, if um, you can work with organizations, uh, I don't know where your church is situated, but there are organizations that might be able to not come in and take over, but just support uh, organizations such as street pastors or others like that might be able to help. Or even if you want to talk to me, 
EA, uh, one people commission, this is part of one of the things we do in that sense, can provide some support in, some, in a background way, not coming in and taking charge, but you are the one on the ground doing that. So, but be encouraging what you're doing. It's good you've created a safe space. Keep it safe. <laughs>